Okay, folks. Uh, today we're going to cover a spur strap deal. And if you're like me, if you ain't horseback, it's not all that interesting. But people seem to be interested in this, so I'm going to show you. This is a normal spur strap, and it can have anything, any kind of buckle, roller buckles, conchos. And uh, it's just a typical spur strap. Well, I don't like them because I don't like them. And uh, if the buckles, especially are on the outside, then I've been known to hang them on the fence or hook them on a piece of hardware or something. And what you'll find out after your birthday cake's pretty big, if you buckle them on the inside, you just put your leg across your knee. Unless you have a prosthetic hip, then you can't do that. So I leave my spurs on my boots because I can't do any of this. Anyway, I'm changing these over to a strap that's just made with a pocket knife. And this is connected on the inside. And this is an old school deal. And you've all seen these great big wide bands, but they all have buckles on them. And some of them had a big uh, round part for here that I saw years ago. But I've learned that I just take the strap and split it and make it custom fit my boot. Well, Chris has got a, a bigger boot and I've got to make a longer strap for him. So this is where we're headed is to make something like this. And uh, I like them because they're cheap, easy to make. And if things get really ugly, they should break. If you get hung up bad, should. I've been hung up and I don't like it. It's it's pretty, pretty bad deal. So when you make them, you just take one that's a, that's used for a pattern, and you have a. You cut one out one direction, and then you cut one out the other way, and you got your left and your right. So I measured his, and what you got to do is you got to measure around the boot so you know how long to make it. In this particular boot, I line it up with the buttons, and I come across, and you can see where it's not going to fit on there. And I like to have a good long enough tab to grab with my hand to unhook it. So I'm going to make this about this long. And then the hole will be farther back. And so that's where I'm headed with this deal. Well, this leather you just get out of the cheap bin. And it's just, this was a belly. The thick side is what we're going to use and you got the thin side. So this is uh, something that a lot of guys don't, well this piece ended up in the bin. So he got it cheap and it's just a, I don't know what you call it. Leftovers. But it's not the real thick leather that's harder to... You don't want real thick leather because this, these, this is how thick this is and it just bends right around my boot nice. And uh, it's still strong enough where so far I've never had one of these break on me. And I change them after a couple years because they, they dry rot. Even if you grease them then they'll start stretching so it... I'm using the thick side of the hide. This is the thin side. That's too thin. So I'm just backing up and I'm making my pattern on the the back of it because I'm going to be making it with a pin. I don't want the ink to be showing on the good side. Nothing but the best for what I do. It's never bothered you before. Yeah. I don't want to brag, but I'm kind of getting high end. So I'll just take it right out the end. And they, you know, they have that thing about don't try this at home. Well, do it at home. If you got a bride as amiable as mine, she don't mind that I do it on her prep counter. <laughs> I built the table, so I got some kind of rights. So now I'm not going to put holes in anything until I cut it out.
Back to the knife. I can't turn the corner clean enough. Okay, so I do this in parts. And when you get all done, you can tell the word handmade, you can tell because nothing's even. <laughs> That's when you know it's handmade. That makes it all the more treasured. A sharp knife is kind of important. If you didn't have a grandpa, you probably don't know how to sharpen a knife, but <laughs> you need to learn. Well, I think I told you folks, you know, our big deal here is the wind. We don't have the tornadoes like the rest of you. We just got flat out wind. So a friend of mine, him and his partner, was riding home. And the guy's a typical cowboy. He was poor, and his Levi jacket didn't have any buttons on the front. So his friend said, why don't you just turn your jacket around? Because you're riding into the wind. So the guy thought, well, sure, that's a good idea. So he turned his jacket around. Heck, man, it was perfect. So they're going along having a ball. They go right down through the middle of town and dang horse blows up and bucks the kid off that turned his jacket around. His partner was in front of him. He just kept going. Pretty soon it dawned on him. His partner wasn't there. So he rode back and there's a group of people standing around this guy. And he rode up and he says, what's the matter? He says, well, that horse bucked him off. He says, was he okay? And the one guy, he said, well, it looks like he broke his neck. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like my jokes. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Did I tell one about pulling a calf? I don't know. There was a guy alongside the road, and he had to pull a calf. It was backwards. He got worried about it, so he went ahead and pulled it, because we all know there's been plenty of backwards calves born. Anyway, he got it all hooked up, and he's sat down with a stick, pulling on his hay string, and he's getting this thing, and the dude pulled up along the highway and got out of his car. He said, uh, excuse me, sir, could I ask, the cowboy said, don't bother me, I'm pulling this calf, can't you see that? So the dude just got real quiet, but he stood there. Finally got the calf out, put it up in front of the mother, and the dude said, can I ask you a question now? He says, yeah, what do you want? He says, how fast was that calf running when it hit that cow? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Homespun humor. <laughs> Slow TV. <laughs> yeah, like watching the locks fill up in Norway. See, if we make this look hard enough, then people will want to buy it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Alright, there's the first one. So, what tools do you need? You need a pocket knife, pen. If you get high end, you use a punch. That's going to be the, the shaft of the button. That'll go right there. Then you make a split off of it. And that way you can get on and off. But you want a circle there, not just a split, because then it'll move on the, on the spur easier. If you put just a slit back here and put it on, then it'll curl the leather. The leather will curl over time. So that's no good. Edger. Edger. Ouch. Oh, you're going to be really fancy.
Now, I don't grease these up until I'm done because, boy, it's hard to work with leather like this when you got it all saddle soaked up. I've been using these kind of straps for probably 25 years. Now you can get a couple years out of them. And, uh, I guess Deb didn't want me to make this video showing this. And I, and I guess one of the reasons is, is that nowadays people are, if you can find anybody that makes anything, they want an arm and a leg for it. So if you can do this yourself, you just, you know, you can save enough money to take your wife out to Chuck E. Cheese or something. You really want to turn the wolf loose. There you go. Yeah, that's going to be plenty long. So I'll trim a little bit off of the, the deal. So that's one. I'll cut the other one out. And here's the tricky part. You got to remember. Yes. When this is done, it'll be the mirror image. Like that. Right. Oh, yeah, that worked out just right. You guys are cheap, 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 cheap. <laughs> Man, live. That's pretty cool. So excited. This is what they call bragging. Here's your pen. What are you going to do with that little triangle of leather that you got there next to your pinky? Oh, this will be a cup holder that they use down in Bermuda. Did you ever tell the story about that poor guy who was calving for you? Had that little calf. So, I was on call every other night for C-sections or any other problems the night man might have. And I was talking about the one that had the little calf born. And you walked in on him. Oh, that one. Yeah. Is this the same guy? No, that guy quit and went to the towel business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was real nervous. He was bugged me for a year. He said, if you'll just hire me, I'll do anything. I'll work in the kitchen. I'll, I'll Whatever you want. I just want to come up and work on a ranch. So about a year, and I said, okay. We're going to start, you know, this. we're going to start branding pretty soon so you can come up. So he came up, and I cut him a horse old enough to boat. In fact, I cut him two of them. And the one horse, the very first day, we went up to sort some bulls. And I had him sitting in the gate, and I said, I'm just going to say in and by, and all you got to do is move the horse. Well, he was so nervous and excited about getting a job that he, I sent a bull to him, and he, I said in, and he turned, and his saddle rolled off his horse, and he fell right on the ground. And the saddle went with him, but it was hanging on the side of the horse. That kid, I've never seen it happen so quick. He hit the ground, he jumped up, he says, I'm, I'm fired. I knew it. I'm fired. And he starts walking. I said, hey, come on back here. He said, I knew I'd get fired the first day. So he right. just forgot. He was so rattled. He didn't cinch his saddle up. But anyway, this nervous kid was calving. And uh, I came in the shed, and he had a little bitty tiny calf on the floor behind this heifer. And the heifer was standing up the way he pulled it, which we did a lot of. And he's leaning over like this. And he's going to stick a straw in his nose. And I said, Dan, I think and about the time she bared down, another calf came out and hit him right in the back of the neck. Embryonic fluid, everything came with her. He jumped around. <laughs> he's walking around that room. He's going, oh, my God. He had all this <laughs> embryonic fluid going down his back. 
when the calf hit the floor, and of course it went bleh, like that, and it made it because of the hitting the floor. But that just killed him. <laughs> he ended up quitting. And uh, he said, this doesn't pay. I can't make it. So he went back to the tile business and did really well. He was a real good guy. So that was Dan. <laughs> it's like the irrigator that we call him Rosin Jaws. He had a buck stitch belt, for those of you that remember buck stitching. And it said Rick on the back. And his name was Steve. This friend of mine told me this story. He said, and he finally one day he said, Steve, how come you got the name Rick on your belt and your name's Steve? He says, well, my dad gave it to me. He says, well, that's nice. Is his name Rick? He said, no. <laughs> 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 That's a rosin job. <laughs> Rainbow Barn, Sheriff Wyoming, <laughs> 6 o'clock a.m. It was open. He'd bring one to town and pick up another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were shipping up in uh, out of Billings. And uh, I don't know, it was probably the third or fourth truck. And a lot of the trucks we used to get in Wyoming, they haul hogs out from Iowa to Denver, and then they'd come up and get a backload of cattle going back to Iowa to the feedlots. And we're shipping, and, you know, it's late fall. And this truck driver, he backed up to the chute, and he didn't get out of the cab. And they get out of the cab, and they always tell you, what do, what do they weigh? You holler at him 500, and he says, okay, I want three, six, nine. They tell you numbers because the cattle trucks have gates, and you put them in compartments. And when you're driving all the way back to Iowa, you want to use all the compartments. Anyway, he never got out of the pickup. I mean, out of his semi. So I'm sitting back there waiting, trying to be polite. And finally, I yelled at the boss. I said, tell him to quit sleeping or whatever he's doing and get back here. So he went and knocked, banged on the door and nothing happened. He opened the door and the truck driver had a heart attack just when he backed up the loading chute. Wow. Now in the melee, they grabbed him, got him into Billings, and nobody thought to shut the truck off. So it ran out of fuel, backed up to a loading chute. Because I'd pulled out. I went and got some more cattle and I was dinking around. Of course, now we've got a truck with no fuel in it dead at a loading chute with a truck driver in a hospital in Billings. So the geniuses got a hold of it with a uh, truck, a uh, dozer, and pulled it out of the way so we could get another truck in. You just, you never know about stuff and what's going to happen. But when we shipped in Montana on the Little Horn, we would load steers, and I think there were 64 head on each truck, and them guys would pull out of the Crow Reservation and go to Garden City and be sitting there three days later up on the ridge waiting to load up again. That was that was one of the biggest shipping deals I worked on. We It took us like three weeks of that, 18 semis. So that was, that was pretty real. But three days it took them to go down to Garden City and back. So... A lot of people don't understand all the hard work that goes into ranching in each entity. But that reminds me, I've mentioned him before, but if there's anybody out there that knew Reg Priest, man, alive, worked for the Bunker Hunt, Hunt Brothers. He was one of the ama most amazing humans I was ever around. He was just nothing but energy. And everybody jumped when he made noise, I'll guarantee you. So if anybody knew Reg Priest, he died in Oklahoma. I think he got crushed by a gate in an alleyway. I'd like to hear if somebody else knew him because he, he was pretty darn famous in the cowboy world. What did he say when he jumped up on your gator? Uh, he was real. He could weigh cattle and look out the window of the scale shack and be able to tell exactly what was going on in every pen out there. Because... One of the truckers didn't use all his compartments, and he could tell by the numbers he hollered or whatever he did. He jumped up on He jumped flat-footed up onto the third rail of the fence, which was amazing in itself. 
He says, I'd like to know why you people cannot load my cattle. <laughs> <laughs> and all us guys that lived up there, we didn't have an accent. And it just sounded so funny to us for him to say that. But I'll guarantee you that truck driver got things right. You couldn't get away with nothing around Ridge. But I remember the Okies that came up to help a ship. They loved helping because our country was wide open. And they said where they lived, it was so haired over. You had to lay down on the ground, look under the brush just to find the cattle. And so they really were good help. And they really liked coming to that Little Horn Ranch. So if any of them are still upright, I'd like to hear from them. So I guess to verify the all the stories. But most of the people I worked with are dead or doing time. Okay. I got to work with the guy that the first day I met him. I forget his last name, but he said, I'm Dick so and so and I if there's lightning I'm leaving. He said it all in one sentence. And I thought, you know, on the well, up on the Crow Reservation, a lot of people have a long name, like Pretty on the Top, or White Man Runs Him, stuff like that. And this guy, he said, my name's Dick so-and-so, and if there's lightning, I go, I leave. And I thought, okay. And he wasn't kidding. There could be lightning a really long ways away, and he would just turn around and leave. And he had told the cow boss, he said, you know, you can fire me, and I don't blame me. He said, but I'm, and nobody ever knew if he witnessed a death or got hit or what, but... I mean, you could just guarantee that he'd quit you. And he had a Queensland healer that wasn't worth killing. And he'd use it. And, of course, we'd doctor cattle all the time. If we were in a big wreck, we'd get together and help each other. And whenever he'd come to help me, he'd bring that dog. And as soon as you, and I know a lot of you guys have seen this, as soon as you neck something, that dog would dive in on him. So that's why I made a real big point to head him. Then he had to heal him and scream at the dog at the same time. And then afterwards, he'd always come and apologize to me. And I said, I don't care. You know, you're the one that has to heal him. He said, I'm really sorry about that. I'm, I lost my temper or something like that. <laughs> oh, he was another good guy. Well, I was real fortunate. I've always had a riding job. I never, I always worked on outfits. It just worked out that they had a riding crew and a farm crew and then a maintenance crew. So I've been blessed as far as cowboying goes because I don't know that there's that many left anymore. But to have just a straight riding job for 20 some years, that was pretty nice. And everybody talks about doctoring the big numbers and all that. Well, we doctored a lot of cattle. On the feed ground, it was just all day long. But during the summertime, because you had 30,000 acres to ride, probably in 1,300 steers or something, if you doctored eight head in one day, that was a really big day. That's with riding out, making the circle, getting them doctored, and getting them the way back. So when you hear big numbers about I doctored 72 head or something, that's either in the feedlot or somebody that didn't ride very far. Because I know I slept good at night when I did eight head. There you are. Now it's time. Now olive oil on these are going to make them real pretty color. That's what we're going to put on them, just on the smooth side. If you put it on the rough outside and the smooth side, they'll stretch too much. Do you put anything on the rough outside? No, it'll smooth itself out. And uh, the spur counter makes this all work. You know, as you can see, it makes it work really nice. But I just, I noticed these, these were handmade by somebody. Looks like they were doing... 20 to 22 years in the deer lodge, but um, they're, they're awful sharp on the edges. But the beauty of it is they got that weight, see, 
it used to be you made really heavy spurs and they'd sit right down on your your spur kind of really nice and this rowel is not a it's almost like a wheel you know when you have that many points on a rowel it's not a real aggressive rowel you could ride anything with this what are you looking at well this was just a flathead screw okay and he cut it off drilled a hole through the band and then peened it over heated it up and peened it over uh -huh. then, then the stirrup on this part here you can tell he uh, got it got it too hot took a piece out of there but that that's genuine handmade spurs. It's no different what I'm doing with these straps. This guy just had to be hand enough to weld and and uh, do whatever he does. But it's to me it's it's typical gear that cowboys figure out, you know. Cowboy wages have never been real high and then you had to quit to get a day off, so it's a different kind of world. Now, I personally prefer a button to come right out of the spur. What do you mean? In other words, the band isn't there. And it's part of the spur. Like that one. There is no band or clip. Got it. You see, it's, it's, I'm not sure... What, Somebody smarter than me can tell you what this was all about, but doesn't matter. Well, that's dead center. <laughs> now you see the different punches I told you about. That screw, is the diameter. Pretty small, really. It's small, but I, I know that it'll be more comfortable if I use this bigger hole. Somebody that actually knows how to do leather work, they'd be leaving the room or changing it over to I Love Lucy by now, I guarantee it, but I ain't doing this for a living, that's for sure. And if you want to get particular, you can just cut that little inside corner off. It's easier to thread it on the screw. That corner? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Chris, to do this right, you need to put the boot on. So I'm just going to stretch it a little bit, and then I'll know where to put that hole. Okay. 
Now my friend Jack over at the DBRM in Reno, if you're watching this, I know you'd be dying to hire me on, but I just don't have time right now, partner. If you guys ever need good gear, you just go to Reno, 4th Street, DBRM, and uh, there's all kinds of folks in there that will help you out. It's pretty neat. Good people. And they have good gear. They don't mess around. So especially you, I know the uh, folks back east, it's a desert for getting gear. Unless you ride flat saddle. And uh, you can get a hold of the DBRM in Reno and they'll ship. You know, they'll ship anywhere. You got. You want to have a tab on there. And you'll, over time, what will really happen is you'll take your knife to it again a year from now. They'll, there'll be a part of it that'll curl up or make you mad or something, and you just take your knife to it. Whenever you make something like this, you don't feel bad cutting it up. It's not like you spend a lot of money on it. A friend of mine died, and he, they took him to the taxidermy, or whatever you call him, getting him ready for the funeral and his wife wanted to see him before they had the service and he went back there and he had on a brown suit laying in the casket and she says oh my god he hated brown that was the worst color in the world for him and the guy says well what color did he like she said blue he said all right she said but the service is going to start now he said don't worry i got it so she went out and pretty quick here they come they laid it out there for everybody to walk by, and he had the blue suit on. And uh, when it was over, she says, well, I sure want to thank you. You really did a quick job. It must have been hard. He says, no, I just changed heads. <laughs> anyway, that's a true story. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> no, you got to show the olive oil. There you go. Olive oil. It's amazing. Thanks, Pat. You do the olive oil and I'll get this other one. So just put it on the... You, you can put it on, on that other wooden um, do it cutting board. The, there you go. It's right there and just pour some on it and rub it in with your fingers. Okay, so there you go. Took about an hour and everybody knows cowboys work by the month, so who cares? And... Uh, these will last him a long time, and that's it. And uh, we were talking about the progression of how all this stuff came about. And as far as I know, what little bit I read about the Dorrance brothers, they were in Walla Walla, Washington, not Walla Walla. Maybe it was Oregon. It's right on the border. And anyway, their father had a lot of teams and stuff, and they grew up ranching, of course, and then they started breaking, starting colts for ranchers and working with horses, and I think that's where that started, and then Ray Hunt followed them, as far as I know. I never, I got to meet Ray Hunt for about an hour, but I never got to meet the Dorrances. But anyway, I, I always appreciated, because everybody told me how humble they were and such honest men, so that's, that's a foundation. It's no different in the colt. There's nothing phony about it. It's real. So, there you go, another little chapter. Don't forget, kids, eat your vegetables. <laughs>